Hi, this is your host Sapin Bharatiya and welcome to TFLS Talk. Today we have with us once again Asaf Igal, CTO and co-founder of Logs.io. Asaf, it's great to have you on the show. Hey, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Today we are going to talk about AI and observability. But before we talk about AI and observability, I would just like to hear, you know, from, from your perspective, when we look at Logs.io, uh, talk a bit about your positioning, your role, in this ever-evolving landscape of observability? The way we view it is that uh, observability today and what used to be called APM in the past is, is broken. Uh, people are collecting too much data. Uh, the, the solutions are too costly. And uh, at, the, at the end of the day, the, the mean time to resolution just increases as, and increases as complexity of the system grow. Uh, we, we view it as a, as a systematic challenge, not only from a technology perspective, but also from a processes perspective, from the way organizations are being managed. Uh, and uh, instead of like setting up specific guidelines of what should you uh, have in observability, they just throw everything in it, at it and say, hey, we'll make sense out of it at some point. Uh, a lot of it has been contributed with traditional uh, vendors of observability that their messaging was, give us all your data, we're going to make sense out of it. Um, but that turned out to be very costly and not really accurate because they couldn't make sense out of it. Um, so the way we see it, observability needs to be well defined, identified, uh, objectives need to be uh, need to be defined, and then you can develop a system which is very, very optimized for cost and very optimized for mean time to resolution. So that's kind of like how we do observability and that's our role in it on offering the system that that is more observability. I was at KubeCon also before that and uh, of course observability, uh, a lot of times there are a lot of things that organizations are trying to do, especially after moving to the cloud, uh, because there is a lot of cloud complexity. They have to deal with a lot of cloud costs. They have to deal with security. They have to deal with performance. How how do you see observability as a practice, discipline, process, tool, or title kind of silo in its own right? Or you see that it overlaps a lot of things because the overall idea, even with observability, is you know to help de developers team, help operators team uh, to increase, improve, you know, the health efficiency of their system. So I want to uh, look at the whole system from the view of observability, and then we'll talk about how AI can come and help them. Does that question make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. And I think uh, one of the things is that people need to realize that the observability should work for them. Uh, and But they, they end up doing it, being in a position where they work for their observability. They spend too much time setting it up. They spend too much time trying to filter out the noise. They spend too much time creating alerts. They spend too much time on alert fatigue, and it actually doesn't work for them. So observability, is a solution that's supposed to make your life better. It, and it's not like you're going to make the observability better. Uh, and and we, th we see it kind of like as a, as a gap that exists today in the market. What kind of challenges organizations face when they look, adopt, you know, observability strategy? And also, if you can talk about, when we talk about observability, what kind of teams, what kind of you know, personas are affected or responsible for it? I think the organization need to realize that there are two ways and basically two different sets of teams that are looking at the production environment. One of them uh, is the engineering team, the product team, the one that developed the solution, the service, and they look at it from like, uh, almost like a vertical perspective. They have an application that are using multiple microservices or being laid out on specific pods running on nodes, running on clusters, running in different regions, running on different clouds maybe, uh, but they don't care. What they care about is that their application is going to de deliver the service that they're obligated towards their customers, and that's how they look at the world. There is a different side of the house, and that house is the DevOps, the SREs, the production engineer. They allocate the infrastructure. They own the clusters. They own the infrastructure on the cloud, and their job is to make sure that the uh, the applications are laid out properly on the infrastructure in the most optimal way from a performance, from a security, from availability, uh, and obviously from a cost perspective. Uh, and they have a different view in the market, um, sorry, on production. Uh, and, and I think any observability vendor would need to realize that uh, same way that we did and build these two different 
ways of looking at the world. One of them is from the application layer uh, down to the infrastructure, and the other one is from the infrastructure laying out all the application on it and, and making sure that this is uh, this is fully optimized and cost effective. Now, let's talk about uh, the role of AI. We have been talking about automation for a long time. AI has been you know used for a long time, but we are now talking about generative AI, which is kind of changing the game. So so talk a bit about observability AI and then also gen AI. Yeah, so I'll start with, uh, with the observability AI. Uh, the challenge of AI is uh, to help you reduce the, the alert that you have. So make sure that when you get an issue, and you, when you get an alert, this is something you need to do something about. Today, when we survey companies, more than 50% of the alerts that they get, they do nothing with it. They can sit around and uh, watch the screen and watch for the alert to go by, and it means nothing. Uh, and it's quite a lot of alerts. So the role of AI is try to identify it. The challenge that today exists in a traditional, what called anomaly detection or AI for anomaly detection, uh, is first of all, on what you set it on. Uh, and a lot of organizations try to set up anomalies on everything. So just alert me when something is, is anomalous. But the reality is that all of the environment are one big anomaly. Things happen, big customer joins, a cluster crashes, a pod being restarted. All of these things happen all the time, and it's all one big anomaly. The way we see it and the way we believe it is that you should, first of all, define your, your SLO. You define your service level objectives. Say, hey, I have a service. I have a payment service. It's supposed to be responsive within 200 milliseconds, and I need to have an error rate below 0 0.001. Uh, and then you can set up uh, AI and you can set up anomaly detection on these things. I want to make sure that my error rate doesn't increase. I want to make sure that my uh, response time doesn't change, or if it changes, then I need to know about it from an anomaly uh, uh, anomaly detection perspective. So. It's a lot about where you set it on kind of like how you define the, the AI. Uh, I think today there is a lot of uh, very good algorithm that every company kind of like adopted for anomaly detection. And it's definitely uh, providing a lot of value in, uh, in observability. When you look at the whole overall, you know, arc of evolution of observability, it's especially when we talk about you know system health or security and a lot of things. It, sometimes it looks like it's more or less reactionary. We have to be prepared for when something goes wrong versus things are prepared. You know when something goes wrong, so we don't have to deal with the complexity. Uh, of course, the whole holiday season is coming, and developers sweat. You know that it will be peak traffic. So, so are you seeing something where, uh, like a good example is that you know in the cars, you know of course there are things like you know airbags, which is when something goes wrong, but then there are a lot of other systems in the car as well that helps you stay, you know, traction control and a lot of things that fix things before something goes wrong. So how are you seeing <laughs> observability here? Or you feel like, hey, this is still out of the scope at least at this point? No, I think it's definitely in scope for this point. And I think this is where a lot of the AI today is being used if, it, if it's defined properly. Uh, and like in a car, you're not setting up alerts on any movement your engine is making. Uh, you're just setting up alert on, on car proximity, you're setting up alert on if you change a lane and you didn't, uh, you didn't mean to change that lane. So there are very few things in a car where you set up alerts uh, to notify you on. Uh, and, and I think this is very similar to, to kind of like observability. You need to, you need to pick your battles. You cannot set up alerts and everything and not everything can be top priority. Uh, and, and we do see being used properly, AI dramatically reduces the alert fatigue. Uh, being used not properly, it creates a lot more noise than it should. Um, so it's a lot about the usage of it. It's, it's less about kind of like the specific algorithms, which today are very uh, well known and commonly used. Talk a bit about the role of generative AI that you see in observability. Uh, I think it's a good question. And uh, I think generative AI, obviously, since the debut of, uh, of uh, ChatGPT made a lot of noise and, uh, and definitely it's, it's becoming very, very helpful for, for organization to use. We also have to understand the limitation of generative AI. Uh, and some of the limitations of generative AI is the model takes a long time to train. It's reliant on all data. So you cannot use generative AI to see what's going on in my system today because it was trained like on a year ago or something like that. Uh, on the other hand, it can process a lot, a lot of information. 
and give you all the right answer that you need. So some of the ways that we, we're we using generative AI, and I think other companies in the observability space as well are, is how can I help uh, users achieve their tasks uh, in a simpler and quicker way? If a user wanted to search, how can I help him search in a more meaningful way, in a quicker way? Because I know the search format, the generative AI knows the search format. Instead of searching in SQL or Lucene or whatever language I have, I can just search in plain English. Give me all the servers that had the most amount of errors in the past two hours. This is something that generative AI does an amazing job on converting it to any other uh, question that you have. The other thing is that we know, which is a limitation and a challenge for organizations, how do I create dashboards and visualizations? How do I create alerts that are meaningful? Uh, if you need to create a meaningful alert, it can have a lot of steps. And, uh, and one of the things that uh, generative AI can do is help identify that and help create sophisticated alerts that would give you the condition that you need. So, so this is something that, uh, that, that we see generative AI being used in the observability space. I think a lot of companies are one idea is that they can add all of their documentation and all of the way of data collection into generative AI, and then you can ask a question about it because you're just completing the model. Uh, we're seeing that type of usage within observability, and obviously, in the future, we would see companies actually indexing or leveraging generative AI with their actual production data in order to ask more sophisticated questions and, and achieve the answer quicker. And how do you see the scope of generative AI? Is it limited to just providing that information or at some point it will also actually enable taking some actions? I talk to a lot of companies who are leveraging generative AI and they are putting them in the product. And they're like, yes, generative AI can do a lot of work, but you still need human intervention there. Uh, you, you can't fully depend or rely on the DVI at this point? I think it's less about the trust. I think it does an amazing job for things that you want. And if you use ChatGPT, I mean, you know that it's that the answers are pretty much accurate. I think the challenges with data accuracy, the, 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 the timeliness of the data. So am I asking a question and am I going to get the answer that was true a year ago or two years ago, whenever the model was trained? And this is why you need some oversight. Um, uh, so I think if you use it in the right way, then you can achieve a lot with it. Uh, if you're trying to make it do something which is not supposed to do, then it's going to be very challenging uh, to achieve that. A few weeks ago, the Biden administration, they came up with an execute order for AI, generative AI, to make it safer for people. Uh, have you seen that executor and what are your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I think that obviously there's a lot of uh, challenges with generative AI. Some of it is uh, it has to do, for example, with the intellectual property. Um, so so uh, capabilities like Copilot and other capabilities that are actually writing code for you. It's like you don't know who who is the IP that is responsible for this code. It's like generate generate for something, but it actually copied it from somewhere else or co cobbled it together from somewhere else. So. There is going to be a lot of uh, uh, challenges with like this. We also see it in, the, I think, in the U.S. There's been a case where uh, a lawyer was using generative AI in, in from as a trial arguments, and uh, generative AI brought up cases that did not never existed. So part of generative AI is also to try a new thing, and that's the way to learn because it's not only leveraging the existing knowledge base; it's also improvising in a way. Uh, and that improvisation can be can be good from creativity perspective, but it also can be challenging uh, uh, from that perspective. Uh, there's, I, I think, we're this is this is a uh, this is a revolution. What's happening with generative AI? I think we're going to see more and more into it in other industry, whether it's the legal, whether it's the 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 movie entry um, um, domain and stuff like that. And it's going to create some challenges, but it's also going to create some opportunities. Um, I, I think the 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 interesting thing is that I think uh, overall, it, kind of like humanity has always been afraid that uh, that robots are going to replace the kind of like the the mundane work, the type of work that everybody can do. But we end up using robots to replace the more sophisticated work uh, about creativity, about art, about 
uh, uh, about this, and I think it's going to be interesting to see where, how, and where all this is going to roll out. Asaf, okay. thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about uh, if the evolution of observability and also the role of AI, generative AI in this space. Thanks for all those great insights, and I would love to have you back on the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.